This presentation is a part of a lecture series on the C++ programming language by Michael Adams at the University of Victoria in Victoria, Canada. For those of you who might be interested, a copy of the slides for this lecture series can be downloaded from the website whose URL is given at the bottom of this slide. In this section, I'm going to be talking about class templates, where a class template provides a mechanism in C++ for specifying a family of classes that can be used, for example, to facilitate the style of programming known as generic programming. Before I introduce class templates in any detail, I first want to talk about the motivation behind class templates. Why would we want such a feature in the language? And I wanted to illustrate this by way of an example. So suppose that we have some application where we need to represent complex numbers. So we develop some complex number class. And in particular, the data members that this class has, called x underscore and y underscore, which are used to represent the real and imaginary parts of the complex number, we choose to use the double type for representing them. In other words, the real and imaginary parts are represented as doubles. And then we write to the rest of the class. We have a constructor which takes the, the real and imaginary part as uh, parameters and they have defaults of zero. So this can be this is a default constructor because it can be called with no arguments. We have a function that allows us to get the real part of the complex number to get the imaginary part of the complex number. And then the dot, dot, dot here corresponds to many, many, many other lines of code providing lots of other functionality for the class. Then at some point later we decide, oh, but also in our program, we'd like to be able to represent complex numbers using float for the real and imaginary parts. So what do we do? Well, then we have to copy all the code that we just wrote, duplicate it all, and change all the doubles into floats. All the places where doubles appear here get changed into float. And then later on we decide, oh, but we'd also like to have a version of the complex number class that can represent the real and imaginary parts using long double, because maybe we have some application where we need very, very accurate representations of numbers. Well, you can see that this causes a lot of problems because we get all of this duplication of code where the code's almost identical, it's just that a few type names are changed here and there. Really what we'd like to do is just write the code once in a more generic way. And this is what's illustrated near the bottom of the slide here. We can have a class called complex. And what we'd really like to do is just use a placeholder, which I've denote, I'm denoting by capital T for the type of the the uh, data members that represent the real and imaginary parts. And we'd like to be able to allow t to be anything. So we'd actually like to have a type, essentially, a class, which is parameterized on the type capital T. And the reason we'd like to be able to do this is, again, we don't really want to have to duplicate lots of code. Because if we create multiple copies of code, then we have to type it multiple times. We have to debug it multiple times. We have to test it multiple times. And for people who are reading the code, trying to understand what it's doing, there's more code that they have to read because they have to read through all of the multiple copies of the code. So it becomes very painful when there's a lot of code duplication going on. And this is basically the motivation or rationale for a feature like class templates. Class templates essentially allow you to avoid all of this code duplication in a very nice way. One type of template in the C++ programming language is what's known as a class template. So a class template is simply a family of classes that are parameterized on one or more parameters. And like other templates in the language, each template parameter can be either a non-type, such as an integral constant like int or unsigned int, or a type, which can be a built-in type or a class type, or a template or a parameter pack in the case of variadic templates. And the general syntax for a class template is what's shown here. Again, templates are introduced by the template keyword, and then this is followed by the parameter list in angle bracket. So we have our opening angle bracket, the parameter list, and a closing angle bracket. And this, this is then followed by the class declaration or definition. So down below I have a code example to make a little bit more concrete what the syntax is for class templates. So first we have a declaration of the class and then following this we have a definition for the same class. So the declaration of a class template, we start out with the keyword template to introduce the template. Then this is followed immediately by the parameter list in angle brackets. So we have our opening angle bracket, we have a parameter t, and then we have another parameter size, and then we have our closing angle bracket here. The first parameter t is a type because of the class keyword here. We could also put type name instead of class. Type name, and, type name and class both mean the same thing in this context. The second parameter called size is a value whose type is unsigned in. Basically size is a compile time constant, a constant expression, which has type unsigned int. Then if we want to show a definition for the class template, um, again, we start out with the keyword template to introduce the template. We have our parameter list for the template in angle brackets. 
And you can see in the definition of the template, the template has a data member called array underscore, which is an array with size elements in it, and uh, the elements have type T. So the, the T here corresponds to the first parameter in the template. So the first parameter in the template is indicating what type is used to represent the elements in the array. And then the size of the array is denoted by size here, and size corresponds to another template parameter, the second template parameter here. Size is an unsigned int, a compile time constant. So this is going to give us an array of a particular size, basically the, the, a fixed size array, where the array is sub denoted by size. And then we could create an, an, an object of this type, of this myarray type, by using a line of code which looks something like this. We say myarray, which is the name of our template. We specify the template parameters in angle brackets. And then we give our variable name here x. So the first parameter here is double, which means that when we instantiate this template, in other words, when we use it, the, the value that's plugged in for t is going to be double. And the value that's going to be plugged in for size here is going to be 100. So this is going to create an array whose size has, a, it has 100 elements in it. And the type of the elements in the array t is double. At this point, I'd like to make a few additional comments about class templates. So the first comment I want to make is that the compiler only generates code for a class template at the point when the class template is instantiated. In other words, it's used. Instantiated is just a fancy way of saying used. And the reason why this is important is because, because the compiler only generates the code for a class template at the point where it's instantiated, the definition of the template must be visible at the point where it's instantiated. In other words, when you actually use the class, the compiler has to actually see the definition of the class at the, at the point where you're using it. Otherwise, it's not going to know what code it needs to generate for that class. And for this reason, class template code is usually placed into header files. This is not always the case, but often you'll find that, that class template code is placed in header files. Another comment I need to make about class templates is that the template code only needs to pass very basic syntax checks. Uh, when you're compiling, unless you actually instantiate the template. And the reason for this is that the compiler can't really do a full syntax check until you actually plug specific parameters into the template, because until you do that, the compiler doesn't really fully know what the code it's going to generate is going to look like. And because of this, there's certain checks that it won't be able to do. Uh, and the reason why this is important to understand is that when you're testing code, you and it has template code in it, you want to make sure that you always instantiate the templates because if you don't instantiate those templates, not only do you not know if the code is going to work because obviously you haven't tested it if you haven't instantiated it, but even worse, you don't even know if the code is going to compile when you instantiate the template because when you instantiate the template, there's additional checking that is done at that point and those checks could fail. In other words, you could have a compile time error that could arise. Uh, the next comment that I want to make about class templates is that as you'll find, as you start using templates, a lot of the errors that are produced that relate to templates by compilers are, are very, very long and difficult to parse and often very cryptic and not really very helpful to lead you to understand what is actually wrong with your code. This is not really a fault of compilers, it's really a weakness of the language, uh, which the, the language doesn't provide a mechanism for specifying what are valid parameters to plug into a template or not. And because you can't specify this to the compiler, it can't really do any checking for you to make sure that the things that you're trying to plug into a template are not insane. And of course, if you plug in insane things, then you're going to get lots of compile errors. Um, hopefully this will be fixed in the future. There's a, a, a language feature that's been proposed called concepts that once this is added, it would provide a mechanism for specifying what parameters can legitimately be passed into a template. And this would allow the compiler to do extra checks and in theory it can produce much more meaningful error messages. But in the meantime, you'll just have to suffer in pain and agony with a lot of the very long and, and uh, overly verbose compiler error messages that are often not very helpful to figuring out what's wrong. Uh, you'll have to just kind of put up with them in the time, for the time being. And then the last comment I want to make about class templates is, is a relatively more minor one. Um, I just want to point out that when you're using templates, sometimes you can end up with situations where you have like a template, like for example, the vector class in the standard library, and then you plug into this template as another parameter, something else that's a template. So there's another template in the standard library which represents complex numbers. And the th only thing that I want to point out here is that notice that you have two angle brackets in a row together here. And the issue here is this looks like a shift operation, the shift operator, one of the shift operators in the language. 
And basically the issue here is when you have nested angle brackets, sometimes there can be ambig ambiguities in terms of is this a nested angle bracket or is it a, a, a less than, less than operator or greater than, greater than. And either, otherwise, the, like the bit shift operations in the C++ programming language. Um, for more basic level programming, it's probably less likely that you'll run into this problem because as of C++11, um, the, they changed some of the rules in terms of how these, these nested uh, angle brackets were parsed. So probably for most kind of more basic usages, this is less likely to be a problem. But if you're doing some other, maybe more advanced programming, there might still be places where this could, could come back and um, bite you. On this slide, I have an example of a class template. So this is a particular example. We're using a class template to represent complex numbers. And the basic idea, as you can see in this class here, we have two data members, which are used to represent the real and imaginary part of the complex number, x underscore for the real part, y underscore for the imaginary part. And the idea is we want to be able to have control over what type is used to represent the real and imaginary part. So we're using the template parameter t here, because t is a template parameter, we're using the template parameter t here to decide what, what particular type is used to represent the real and imaginary part of the complex number. So as you can see with our template, it's, we have the template keyword, then we have an angle brackets, the parameter list for the template. So we have a single parameter t, it's a type because of the class keyword here. We could also put type name here. It means the same thing. In terms of member functions, we have a few different member functions. We have a constructor for constructing complex numbers. Um, it's a default constructor because we have default values for both of the parameters here. So we can call this function with no arguments. Um, so this corresponds to a default constructor, but we can of course provide values for the parameter X and Y, in which case we can control the specific real and imaginary parts that our complex number will be initialized to when it's constructed. We have a member function called real, which returns the real part of the complex number, and the return type is t, of course, because this corresponds to the type of the real and imaginary part. We have another member function which can be used to return the imaginary part of the complex number. Again, the return type is t, because the significance of t, this is the type that we're using to represent the real and imaginary part of the complex number. And then at the bottom here, we have some examples of variables that are being created that are using this class template. So we have this very object called zi, which is a complex int. So we're creating a complex variable using our template, and the template parameter we're specifying is int. So this is going to be equivalent to setting t equal to int. So we're going to instantiate this class here for the case that t is equal to int. So what we'll end up with here is zi will be a variable a complex number type variable where the real and imaginary part are represented using int. Complex double, on the other hand, this variable zd, which is, has type complex double, this is going to be instantiating our complex number class for t equal to double. So in this case, the real and imaginary part, which correspond to the types t, are going to be double in this case. In other words, we're going to be representing the real and imaginary part using doubles um, for this particular variable zd. Earlier when we talked about functions in the language, we saw that functions can have default arguments. In an analogous way, template parameters can also have default values. And I have an example on this slide to help illustrate how default parameter values work for class templates. So we have a class template called MyArray, and it's a very simple template. Essentially, it has a single member, a data member called data, which is an array of size size, and each element in the array has type T. And the two template parameters for this class, there's two of them, one is called t, and one of them is called size. The first one, t, is a type, because of the class keyword here, so t is a type, and it has a default value int. So if we don't specify what t is, it will default to the type int. Similarly, the second parameter, size here, which is a non-type parameter, it has type unsigned int, it has a default value of two. So if we don't specify a value for this parameter, it will default to two. And then down below, we have some examples of code that's using the class. So we tried to create an, a variable called a of the type myarray. And notice here, we left the angle brackets empty. In other words, we actually didn't specify either of the template parameters for this class. But that's OK, because they both have defaults. So the first parameter, which we didn't specify, will default to int. And the second parameter that we didn't specify will default to 2. So leaving these angle brackets empty is equivalent to putting int and 2 in the angle brackets. In other words, the default values. If, for example, we only specified the first parameter, first template parameter, double, and we left the second one empty, didn't specify it, 
In this case, the second parameter, which we didn't specify, would default to two. So saying my array double would be the same as saying my array double and then two. The, the second parameter gets defaulted. And then lastly, we can explicitly specify both of the parameters. So we can say my array and then specify the first parameter explicitly to be double and the second parameter explicit to be, explicitly to be 10, in which case neither one of these default values is used. And we specify both of them explicitly. Due to the syntax of the C++ programming language, ambiguities can arise when certain types of names appear in template code. In particular, when a qualified dependent name appears in template code, the compiler has no way of knowing, when first parsing the template code, whether the name refers to a non-type, a type, or a template. To resolve this problem, the language adopted the rule that unless explicitly indicated otherwise, a qualified dependent name in a template always refers to a non-type. To have a qualified dependent name be treated as a type, the name must be prefixed by the keyword type name. So on this slide, I have a code example to help illustrate this further. We have this class template called vector, which is parameterized on a single template parameter, t, which is a class. We have a number of type members, one called coordinate, one called distance. Coordinate is the type that's used to represent the coordinates of the vector. Distance is a type that's used to represent length when the, for the, when the vector is involved. And coordinate, for example, is just an alias for a t colon colon coordinate. In other words, there's a type member inside the class t called coordinate. And we're setting up a type alias for this just to call it coordinate. But the key thing to note here is notice that we have to introduce the word type name here. The reason for this is that t colon colon coordinate is a qualified dependent name. It's qualified because of the scope resolution operator here, colon, colon. It's dependent because the meaning of coordinate depends on what t is chosen to be, and t is a template parameter. So in other words, the coordinate here depends on a template parameter t. Therefore, it's a dependent name. So normally, if we didn't put the type name keyword here, t colon colon coordinate would be treated as if it's not the name of a type which is not what we want here. We want it to be treated as the name of a type, so we have to put type name in front of it. And then similarly for the, um, the distance type number here, it's just an alias for t colon colon distance. But again, t colon colon distance, it's a qualified dependent name. And because we want this qualified dependent name to be treated as a type, we have to put type name in front of it. If we don't do this, then the compiler will assume that t colon colon distance is not naming a type. It's just a non-type. There's a few other places where we have qualified dependent names in this, this code here. Down below, we have std colon colon vector coordinate colon colon const iterator. This is a qualified dependent name as well. And in particular, it's a qualified dependent name that names a type because const iterator is the name of a type. So in order for this long name here to be treated as a type, we have to prefix it by type name. And then lastly, we have another qualified dependent name. Uh, std colon colon vector coordinate colon colon value type. Again, value type is a, is, a, is a dependent name because it's dependent on how coordinate is chosen and coordinate depends on a type or a template parameter t. So this corresponds to a um, dependent name. It's a qualified name because of the scope resolution operators that appear in it. Therefore, in order for this qualified dependent name to be treated as a type, we have to prefix it by the type name keyword. Otherwise, it won't be treated a type, as a type, which would lead to a, a compile error because the way we're using it is assuming implicitly that it is the name of a type.